Hi, everyone. My name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm the executive director of Afikra. Thank you so much for joining. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest. Uh, Khashag Apalian is a lettering artist type and graphic designer. He currently operates under the name Debakir, I think I'm saying that right, uh, which is Armenian for printed type and is in constant collaboration with different type foundries and different and design studios. He also teaches graphic design courses at the American University of Beirut. Khashag, thank you so much for joining Africa Conversations. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, I mean, I was going to say you guys are the kind ones to having me for this uh, conversation. How's it we going? are so happy to have you. I guess I want to start with um, with your name. Yes. I love that you have a, a name. You're like a hip hop artist. I love this. When did you decide to, <laughs> when did you sort of uh, operate, decide to operate under a specific name? Uh, which part? The Bakir you're talking about? Yeah, or the Bakir, yeah. Well, I think it was, um, I had to start, I had to create a website when I was uh, the, studying in my type, in type in media doing my master and it was in 2008, nine. Well, before graduating, we had to do like, a, we had to have a website and it was the first time I was going to get a website. So I had to do a test and see, I wanted to do something Armenian. I want to select a, 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 a name in Armenian. And since I was working with type and in Armenian type is, print type is the Bakir. So, and I, it sounded also, it, it was easy also to pronounce. So since then I was like, let's go for it. Okay. I want to ask you a really like um, a very uh, theoretical question. I spoke to you about this a little bit before we got started. Yeah. This, this font that I'm looking at here is called uh, Brando. Yeah. Where do you come up with names for new typefaces and how inspired by those names or by concepts um, are you really, are you really when you approach these new projects? Well, this one is an easy one because the, the Latin typeface was designed by Mike Abink uh, and he named uh, the typeface Brando. He did tell us the story, uh, but I, at the moment, I forgot why it was called Brando. So this one particularly is an easy one for us. So we just called it Brando Arabic. Uh, but it's it, it's really it's interesting because every every designer has its own process for uh, naming fonts. For, for me, usually it's it's random. It's just how it looks and how it sounds most of the times. But Brando particularly is not my name. It's not the name that we put. It's uh, it's Mike Abing. He he called the name the typeface Brando. So, um, oh, I, I was I was hoping you would take credit for it because I'm I'm you know the way as I was saying before the call like um, typography typefaces they are abstract tools right um, and so when they would if they would get a name for me is is really really interesting. Do you find that the names are just an afterthought, after, uh, or are, is it at the forefront of the process of the design? For me, particularly, it is, it's, it's random. It really is random. It's just uh, depending on how I feel when, I, when I'm doing it, I, I just call it. Sometimes it's, I, I'm not that creative with naming. Sometimes I just call it like I'm, I'm working on a typeface now that is going to be for probably for newspaper headlines or it's inspired by newspaper headlines. So I just call it Charida. It's not published, but... Uh, but at least the work in progress name for me is Jarida. So it depends on each name. Arek was uh, an Armenian typeface. The first typeface that I designed uh, is called Arek. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's exactly this one. And Arek, for example, is, uh, I, I called it because it was uh, the name of the theater group that I used to be part of when I was a kid. And it just, it was something that was nostalgic. nostalgic. And also it's, a, it's short, it's four letters and it sounds good and it has a K in it. So I, and it starts with an A. So yeah, this one was- Wait, uh, walk me through, am I ignorant? Why does it starting with an A and ending, and having a K? Um, Ajak Apelian, so- K. Oh, okay. It's a, a little <laughs> inside story. <laughs> okay, all right, now I get it. Um, so, you know, designers in general are solving problems, right? So that, that's like in many, that's a, 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 a sort of a functional definition of design is that like solutions to problems. Um, 
when you when you start working on a new uh, a new project, do you have a problem in mind? Or is there a specific thing like, oh, damn it, there isn't something for this. I need to solve this problem. Or how do you approach it? Uh, depends on the brief. Usually when I'm doing something in like when I'm initiating the project myself, uh, yeah, I, I kind of I had this conversation once with Chris. I can't work Christian Sarkis, I can't work on typefaces that I can't see them being used. So for me, it needs to it needs to have, I mean, there needs to be a reason that I'm gonna create this typeface. So if there's most of the times it's because there's there's the lack of. Yeah. So so then I I, I and for me, when I, I, I'm, I'm also a graphic designer, so I, I, I can't be a full-time type designer. I don't have the patience to do that. So I always take the break and alternate between type design and graphic design. And uh, so my graphic design practice also a lot of times informs and, and, and pushes me to let's say, okay, I, I need something that looks like this. So, so I wanna create a typeface that looks like that. Some, most of the times in the beginning, it's not a typeface, it's a lettering piece, or it's like a full typeface with some letters there, some letters missing, then eventually I, I, I complete it and, and make it into a typeface. But it's most of the times the function is where I start from the need and something that's missing. So like this one, right? This uh, one on the left hand. Yeah. Can you walk me through the story of this? Uh, well, this one particularly, this one was, I think the second typeface I was working on after I graduated uh, from Type and Media, I was invited by Huda Abi Faris mm -hmm. uh, from the Khat Foundation to uh, to be part of the typographic matchmaking project that she had initiated. This one was the second typographic matchmaking, and the idea was to bring together um, Dutch designers and Arab designers uh, and come up with a typeface that could be worked that could work in the environment. Now, this one particularly is flat, but the idea was that. Um, so it's a, it's a collaboration with uh, René Knip and uh, Jeroen van Erp. Jeroen was the architect in the team who was uh, consulting us with how to think of the typeface that is going to be used in this space. So actually, if you look, uh, Google it, uh, you can find more examples that are being, that this typeface is being used in the space itself. So the idea was to come up with something that is very, very, very basic and uh, almost like, a, like the, the, the most fundamental parts of the letter forms. And these dots are just there to, 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 to fill the space. But the idea was that these, each dot, each unit can be replaced by anything that you could imagine. And in, in, it could be, let's say, you can make it with chairs, with chairs or in the sand or or anything. So, and at the same time, the challenge was also to to do something that was. I was working on the Arabic, and Renee was working on the on the Latin. So it also had to have a conversation together, and and like not necessarily in this case look the same, yeah. or have the same spirit, or have the same feel. So, I'm really curious about your answer to this question. Okay, I've I've in the last like couple months. I've spoken to a lot of uh, your colleagues, right? Many of many of whom are your friends. Yeah. And I'm curious about a really basic question. The work you're doing um, is technical, right? I mean, it's artistic, but it's very, very technical. And there are technical skills that you sharpen over a career. Yeah. If you look at an early font you've decided you designed. Do you see technical mishaps that if you were designing it today, you'd be like, I'd never do it that way. That's a huge, uh, that's a huge mistake. Oh, uh, yes, that is the worst question. Yes, yes. Uh, Can you give me an example? Like, take us behind the curtain a little bit. What's an example of something you're like, oh my God, that's so bad. I would no, never would have done that. Uh, I mean, I'm not, no, I don't regret on doing anything. Uh, I, there's nothing that I'm not proud of that I have. Or no, that my eye would be blind to. That's what I mean, an or untrained maybe, eye. Yeah. No, no, an untrained, untrained eye would not necessarily see that. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, I would definitely see, for example, the one on the right graphic was the first typeface Wael and I, Wael Moros and I, we, uh, we, we worked on together. It's also the, uh, the graphic Latin existed and it was a typeface that was designed by Christian Schwartz. And we had to come up with, uh, with the with, um, uh, Arabic version for it. Uh, in this case, particularly, the Latin is a grotesque typeface. It has, it has a certain baggage 
It has a certain, let's say, brief that is very alien to the Arabic. So Wal and I had to come up with solutions that at the time made sense. Now, sometimes we look at it and we have some things that make us like itch, yeah. we change. But uh, yeah, but I mean, for example, Christian particularly doesn't allow us to change anything because he, because the typefaces never end. Yeah. Like you, you, at some point you need to decide that, okay, now I'm done with this. I'm going to go to the next one. Otherwise it's a never ending process that you're always trying to make it look better or, or fix the spacing or fix whatever it is, the connections. So in this case, time plays a role and you say, you just decide that it's done. I mean, it is, I think in, as graphic designers or designers, or maybe visual people, we always have this, this, uh, let's say uh, fight over like, Oh, what did I do? What did I do? I yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I'm still, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat, somewhat peaceful with that, uh, with that aspect of things. And you mentioned theater earlier. At what point did you decide that you were going to, you know, go into this line of work? Just if you give us a little biographical background, when did you decide you were going to be spending so much time doing this? Okay, so I don't know. I think a lot of people don't know about this. It's like a small little uh, hidden secret. Um, when I was a, like when I was a kid, I used to be part of the theater group, and I used to also dance. So amazing. <laughs> So I have, it's like a semi-professional dance team that I, was, I used to be part of. And uh, I did that for 12 years. And at the what time- What style of dance? So basically it's, it's part of this uh, Armenian culture organization called Hamas Kain. And uh, they have, it's, it's based on, so they have different kinds of art, uh, let's say artistic uh, outlets where you can either do dance or theater or uh, music. And it, the idea is to preserve the Armenian culture. And uh, growing up, I was part of that group. And uh, the base of the dance was ballet, but we used to not perform ballet. We used to perform folkloric dances. So at the time, when I had graduated from school, I wanted to do performing arts. But uh, the, the university that I could do it in, the, in, in English was very expensive. The one in the Lebaniye, the the one that I could afford was in Arabic, and I wasn't comfortable doing it in Arabic. So a friend of mine, she used to be a, like in semi dancing and in the same group. She she was like I think a couple of years older than me. She had done graphic design, and I was like, you know what? She's doing it, and she's in the same let's say circle. Let me just do that. The first year, I had no idea what graphic design was. I just went with it, and then eventually. Things went on, and I think I mean I, I'm up here now. <laughs> okay, that makes that makes sense to me because as I was reading about your bio, um, about your sort of background, your your approach to work is highly collaborative, um, and it's it strikes me as an outlier. I don't think everyone in, in most fields, you know. Uh, people like to work alone. It's, 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 I think it's rare. It, am I wrong about that? Uh, I'm, I don't know. I mean, interesting that you say that because for me, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, mo it turns out that most of the work that I do is collaborative, but I yeah. do enjoy also working by myself a lot. Yeah. So uh, it just happened this way. I think, I mean, the people that I collab, that I'm comfortable collaborating with, but for example, the typefaces that I design, these two, in this case, Lyon and uh, Graphic, most of the typefaces I'm designing with Wael. Wael, yeah. is, Wael and I, we were in university. Uh, we met in university the first day of university, uh, the undergrads. And since then, we have, take, we have taken all the courses together. So we're also very, very close friends and we yeah. have a history. So that's why I think these collaborations feel more natural. yeah natural yeah um okay i want to talk about this uh for a second um i was struck that these two projects were both in the same year um and to me they seem so drastically different i mean they seem like different different people different artists uh put these together mm -hmm. um 
is that because I have an untrained eye and there's, there's actual visual similarities and, or do you, do you uh, see these as being really, really different as well? And what was oh, yeah, definitely. These? They're very, very, very different. Uh, this, these two are book covers that uh, I designed with Lara Bala. We, at the time, I, I used to have a uh, design studio called Majun that we, that with uh, Lara. And this, uh, we had a, one of our, let's say, ongoing clients was Achette Antoine. And uh, they had Naufal as a sub publishing house under mm -hmm. Achette Antoine. And uh, uh, so they, we, we, we were designing most of their covers at the time. Uh, these two particular ones are uh, custom, like we, because we developed a series of templates for them, but these two are like independent ones. Uh, between the two, I think the one on the right, we had more creative freedom than the one on the left. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think there are two different, uh, completely different uh, book covers just because they're completely also different uh, content. One, Ahlam Mustaghani was, is like the Daniel Steele of the Arab world. Yeah. So it had to be, um, it, she, she loved decoration and, and, and ornamentation and flowers. We had one book cover that she insisted that we had to have this particular flower on it. And the one on the right was, we had much more creative freedom in that one because it was uh, Jibran Khalid Jibran. And uh, this one is a series, like most of his work. So it was, um, we just ought to use a lettering style that is very particular and uh, expressive. So yeah, the two are, are quite different untrained eye, but quite uh, trained. <laughs> okay. So, so, okay. I want to talk about, um, before I get to this, I want to talk about your corporate work yes. because in general, the work that like I'm attracted to in general, uh, in terms of talking about is I like talking about unsexy topics, right? Oh. And corporate projects are extremely unsexy. Yeah, And as I said to you um, before the call, I was saying it seems as though the job, part of the brief for something like this, which is for Samsung One, is to create a, a system that fades away, right? Where people don't really notice the, the work. Um, can you talk about that challenge like, and the, the scale of the work that you, you, that, you know, the scale of the project? Yeah, well, Samsung One, uh... As it says on the on the slide, it was a collaboration with Broad Associates, and again the brief was uh, you would notice from by now that most of the briefs of the specifically the corporate actually no not necessarily the corporate ones only the corporate ones but specifically uh, the Latin one exists or at least it's being developed and then I get hired to design the Arabic version for it. This one particularly was to typeface that is going to be used throughout for and and in different sizes in different contexts for text mostly for text uh for their let's say you know you, when you you buy a tv and then you get this booklet that mm -hmm. you read with, with written in like six point type so it had to 64 be 64 languages yes <laughs> so, so it had to work it had to be very versatile uh and uh when we're when it's a it's a text typeface. It really is important that when you're reading it, you don't want to notice it. Uh, uh, so it, that's why this one particularly had this this like this brief was the brief was part of the uh, making it invisible was part of the brief. And uh, if you look at the Latin, maybe also the Arabic has the same thing. Is that it almost looks undesigned somehow. And uh, the Arabic one was based on Nasikh, which is a style that is, again, something that people don't necessarily realize because they've been used to reading it for, for, for a long time. So the, it, it, it still is something that looks contemporary, but, is it, but it's using the proportions, the, the, let's say, the, the details in, in letter forms that the, the average eye would not necessarily notice and they would just say that this is something that is usually when we say when when they're no when someone is noticing a text typeface it's not it's not a good idea it's not a good sign <laughs> yeah so I, I um i asked this question to christian who i think is on the on the call and so i'm, I'm curious to hear your answer um about this 
if you were to create like a, a rubric or like a matrix for um, rubrics, the right word, if you were to create a rubric um, to grade the success of a typeface, um, what are the elements that you would even think about? Is it like readability? Is it flexibility? Like, how do you, yeah, how, how do you, uh, how do you all, judge? The, all of that? I mean, it depends. It really depends on the brief. Sometimes, uh, uh, I mean, details in, sometimes if it's for display purposes, sometimes if it's an experimental typeface, I mean, you, you look at the typeface, for example, the typographic matchmaking project that I talked about uh, in the beginning, specifically the second one, which was about the environment. You would look at the sum of the typefaces and you would say, this is, what is this? I can't even read it. It's ugly. Uh, I don't understand why this was the case. And actually you would say, for me, at sometimes I had that class because the people who worked on these, on these typefaces were well-known type designers or at least designers who knew how to work with letters. But it's, it's really about context. If you see that on paper, which is where you're judging it is not fair because this typeface is supposed to be, let's say each letter is supposed to be five meters by five meters. So then you would start understanding that, okay, it's something structural. So you, you let go of the criteria, the typical criteria of legibility and, and uh, let's say this harsh judgment of aesthetics, like I don't like it or whatever. So it really depends on the brief. If it's a text typeface, if it's supposed to be uh, something that I'm reading in a novel, uh, I don't want to, let's say sometimes if you're doing a, we, the designers, uh, type designers particularly, sometimes we like to have some particular uh, specificity in some letter or like we want the G to look this way. But when you're reading it and then every time you're reading the G is popping in your eyes, then that's not a good sign for the typeface. So you, it, it really depends on the brief. So yeah, that would be, I mean. Do you, yeah, as a designer, are you trying to, is, do, or is there like a trademark that you'd like to have in theory where everyone can be like, oh, that's a Khashaga, that's a Khashaga typeface? Uh, do you so, want to be noticed? Yes and yes. <laughs> You're like question mark yes <laughs> i mean yes and no uh i'm i'm at the moment i don't have any kind of uh, these things i don't think about i mean i just go with the flow and do whatever i feel like doing when come when on the spot but for example my brother is is he's not into design at all he comes from a medical background uh sometimes he he sees stuff and he says is this you? And then it actually would be me. Nice. So, so it turns out I do have a style, although I don't, I mean, I do, I can describe it, but I don't see it that much as people do see it. Mm. So yeah, I think I do have a trademark, it seems. Okay, cool. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so if we think about other corporate clients uh, and in particular Disney, um, who you've worked with, um, walk me through what the challenges with these types of uh, briefs. Yeah, this one was a fun one. Again, this one was a project that we did, Lara and I, when I was working as uh, Majoun. And mm -hmm. this one was also part of uh, Achette Antoine. So they had done, they had, they had the, the license to publish uh, Disney books uh, in uh, translate Disney books into Arabic and publish them. So initially they had, uh, they, they were not just, they would use the, the, the English logo, the Latin logo and have everything else in Arabic. And actually we were lucky this, uh, Achette Antoine had, um, uh, one of the people that worked in Achette Antoine, her name is Pascal Ahwaji. She was really very, very, um, uh, like she had a very, um, she respected design and she had, she, she trusted us as designers and, and she, she, she really gave us room to play with, with whatever we, we thought that should be done. So in this particular case, uh, it was, it was, let's say, adapting whatever you see in the Latin into Arabic. So we, it was important for us that we don't copy because there are a lot of Disney logos that you can see that they're taking some shapes of the, because they're, they're very per, per, per peculiar, right? So mm -hmm. they have a particular kind of mood that is that, and, and also if it's not 
a mood, it, it's also a classic, so you, you, you recognize them. So uh, the, the general direction for these kind of adaptations would be to take uh, parts of the Latin and then make it and adapt it and apply it on the Arabic so the Arabic would look like the Latin. Uh, at the time, we did not do that. We, it was important for us that we wanted to keep the Arabic Arabic and try to understand what was happening in the Latin and, uh, and adapt that idea, let's say, theoretically or conceptually to the Arabic, but without compromising on the, on the, on the integrity of the Arabic script. So this was part of that. And it was, we had, this is just an example. We had, I think, a series of 25 different logos. It was a fun, fun project that we had to uh, think about. Uh, designed actually. So it, out of curiosity, <laughs> I don't mean to have you kill your babies, but of these eight that are in front of you, which one do you think exemplifies the best execution and the one and which of them do you think, ugh, this didn't quite hit the mark? Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> I would say, I think the Jungle Book would be my favorite and Plains my least favorite. So interesting. Okay. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to actually jump to that slide because they're on the same slide or no. Okay. Let's talk about Jungle Book for a second. Yeah. What do you find, what sort of attracts you to this? Why is this more successful than um, some of the others? Um, basically because the, the, when you look at the, the, the Latin, it has a particular style that is supposedly known as classical, which is the serif and something like something again, quote unquote, classical is easier to, again, it's not easy, but it's easier to adapt into Arabic while you're taking something that is much more Arabic looking and proper, like it has a sp specific style that is, that is the Nasikh, that is using a contrast that is high. So you can see that there's a difference between the thick and thin parts, which is being also applied in the Arabic. And these swashes that you see in the J, B, and K, are also applied in the calf, be and lam in a somewhat natural way because you do see some styles, of course, not in this particular form, but you do see some styles in the Arabic script that have these kind of swashes sometimes. So I think it was also, that's why I feel that it works mostly the best. Others, sometimes you have some concepts in Latin that are too Latin and adapting that into Arabic would give you some questions where is it really the most uh, successful, let's say, route to go to? Mm -hmm. So we'll look at we'll look at planes. Planes is the the reason I I meant I mean it's interesting that you have both the mini and planes in, uh, in in the same slide. Here is like we're using the square Kufi style, which is which is this uh, modular style that used to be used on architectural facades. And it's, it's really a, a very easy exercise in this case. So that's why for me, there's not much challenge here. So almost like anyone can do this. Mm -hmm. so, okay, fine. I mean, we did it because it had to be matching. And the, yeah. we, did, we went, we ought to this style because also the Latin had something that is much more blocky, something that is more, less contrast. So there's not much difference between the thick and thin. And it's also capitals. It was hard to translate that into. Mm, interesting. Uh, yeah, for me, the, the one that I would have imagined would have been the trickiest would have been like the Little Mermaid or, yeah, uh, or Lion, Lion King, because it's mm -hmm. like, there's just not much to work with. Yeah. Like Lion King, like how did you even approach this? Like how many, or let me, let me change the question. How many drafts of this did you like throw out? <laughs> well, um, I don't remember. It was quite a long yeah. time ago. But again, it wasn't, I mean, uh, it, it's not that hard in this one particularly because again, it's, it's using the Latin is, is, a, is a particular style that, has, that, is, that could be considered classical. And, yeah. and we have a lot of, like we have data, let's say the classical Nesek or the classical Thuluth mm -hmm. uh, styles that we can take a lot of information from and adapt it to something like this. I mean, I would still say it looks a little bit uh, Maybe the the Arabic one looks a little bit deformed because like some letters are we 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 had to make the scene and the meme and the dial a little bit much a little bit bigger than usual in terms of proportions just to yeah. fill in the space that we have there. So uh, 
but yeah, it's still it's a it's quite a let's say uh, straight 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 to the point uh, exercise in this case in this particular case. Okay, cool. I want to ask you one last question mm -hmm. about or uh, two last questions, and I'll we'll start with your role as an educator. So um, you've been a part of a series of workshops. I think they always take place at AUB. Am I right about that? Or no, actually not. I think only one of them took place. Only one of them. So tell me the story of the conception of this series and where you've done them. And then I want to talk to you about the curriculum and how that sort of emerged. So this one is a project that uh, we started uh, in, I don't remember when was it. It was, the, well, I think, the second or the third design week in Beirut. Uh, we wanted to take part of it, and uh, at the time I was I was Majun with Lara, and we wanted to do a collaboration with Chris, Christian Sarkis. So the first one you can see already on the. We always have uh, uh, the names of the people who are who are uh, doing the work, like who are conducting the workshop. So the first one was that, and then uh, throughout the time, Wael joined us as well. So now currently this project is uh, a project that we do Wael more. Well, Chris and I, and it's a workshop series that we, when we used to be able to travel, is something that we used to travel and do it in different. Let's say if it's if there's a type conference, we used to participate and doing and do it in a type conference, or sometimes we used to get invited. Uh, well, I got invited a few times in New York to do it. So the black one, for example, is a, he was invited to introduce Arabic as a script to the New York Times. Uh, uh, team, so he was there to give this workshop. So it really depends, and so we also try with whichever, um, uh, let's say, which wherever we're going, we try to adapt the theme over the. For example, the first one, the number nine. This one was uh, Christian and I. We were invited to go uh, give a talk and a workshop in Moscow. So the idea here is that uh, there's three letterings. The, there's Armenian, Arabic, and uh, Cyrillic that are inside inside one another, and basically we were trying to uh, mimic the idea of the Russian dolls. So I mean Moscow, Russian. Yeah. Dolls. So yeah, so the, so it's a it's a series of workshops depending on whatever context is we, we we were doing it. But the idea is that we are introducing the the, the participants to the basics of what you need to be able to do the, let's say, the most um, the, the, a lettering piece in Arabic. So what do you need to think about in, in order to you to create something that is expressive and, and, and how, do you manip how can you manipulate the letters to, to, do, to do whatever you want, them, want it to do? And is it the goal, um, is the goal to take novices um, introduce novices into this whole new world, or is it to take really successful type designers and say, "Hey, you guys could also do this in this in this new language"? Like, why does this series exist? Uh, that I, I mean, I think because we want to have fun yeah. and we wanted to do lettering because we wanted to have a, 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 a let's say a, an outlet where we can do uh, let's say cool lettering exercises. And also, obviously, uh, we wanted to, uh, I'm going to go in a very romantic way, we wanted to share our knowledge with the people. And sure. <laughs> and and, and uh, because we, we, I mean, it's, I mean, we're, I'm joking, but seriously, though, we, we, we were, we, it was also a reaction to what we were seeing around. We were, we were seeing, like, we were complaining a lot that, oh my God, look at this, it's ugly, look at that, how it's done. And we come from a very rich world of, of Arabic lettering. If you look at the, I don't know, 50s, 60s, 70s ads, there are so many interesting lettering pieces from then. And a lot of people have missed that. And instead of complaining, we started, we, we thought that maybe if we start injecting these ideas into uh, students, I mean, most of the participants are uh, students who are uh, like the studying graphic design. We rarely had anyone who was completely out of uh, design. The one in, for example, the one in Moscow was very interesting because none of them spoke or read or wrote Arabic. They were all uh, from Moscow. So yeah, it's, it's just an introduction to this world of lettering. 
Yeah. Okay, I want to talk to you uh, about um, designing um, dual language uh, logos and how you approach these types of projects. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit similar to the to the Disney pro, uh, Disney uh, logos. Uh, it's it's always important for me uh, or for us, let's say, because Christian, Boel, and I we're we're all, I mean, we have a lot of people who are in the same group. Naima is here. Naila is here. Uh, it's it's important to keep. It's there. There was a trend where. And actually, I just received a brief now from a client, and they had the same uh, aspect where the the Latin is has a, a rich history of of let's say aesthetic language, and and there are a lot of typefaces, a lot of designers who are coming up with logos, and generally, when you when they want to translate that into Arabic, they try to because we have a lot of information in in the Latin world, they try to get that information and adapt and apply it to the Arabic. Uh, for us, we realize that it's 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 comprom- the, the Arabic script itself is being compromised a lot, and th- there's a lot of room to play with Arabic and make it look contemporary and modern, without without losing its integrity. So uh, every time we're working, I'm working on on any kind of bilingual uh, project. I try to, as much as possible, not think that I want to do something that looks the same. I mean, depends on what what the brief is as well. For example, for Helen, the the the, the English one is almost coming as a signature, and the, the logo is actually the Arabic. Yeah. For Beirut Speak Jazz, uh, again, it was uh, the modularity is there. So for both, actually, tolerance for the tolerance logo and the Beirut Speak Jazz, uh, we use the the modularity is there. And how do you adapt this? Mo- apply this modularity into the Arabic script. So this is always the, the, that's the thing that come that is in our in my mind every time that I'm working on it. I want the Arabic to look Arabic, the Latin to look Latin, but then they can they can come and sit together nicely. Okay, I'm gonna um, move on to our, our quick Q and A. Um, as I do that, I'm just curious um, who's who was doing this work 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> This as in developing Arabic typefaces. Uh, well, not a lot. Uh, I think at the time, uh, Nadine Shaheen was one of the first, uh, let's say, type designers who actually was a, who had an education as a master's in type design. Before that, there were a lot of. I mean, there were quite some uh, type designers who have done uh, Arabic typefaces, but not in the same way as as. What we're seeing nowadays, a lot of is there like clearly a new school and an old yeah. school? Yeah, I think I think there's a I think there's a clear uh, new. I'm not going to call it trend, but let's say some sort of a new direction of or no, new movement of of uh, of how to design Arabic typefaces or doing Arabic lettering. And do you think it's a, a response to the older to a diff, that generation? It's a clear. Yeah, yeah. It's a clear. We are zigging where you were zagging. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, sometimes we look at the typefaces that are produced from that time, and a lot of times we we have. I mean, maybe it's not fair, but we have this. Like, oh my God, what is this? It's ugly, or it's very badly done. But I I always say that if those weren't if if these typefaces didn't exist in that way, most may most probably we wouldn't have done what we're doing now, because it's always a reaction of something. So we saw that and we reacted to it, and we did what we're doing now. Is it is it technic is the work technically bad or is it like we look at our we look at our uh, parents generation we say how are you wearing those jeans and then <laughs> and ten years later we're going to wear, be wearing those jeans like again it's a look so for I think the part where Arabic was not being developed digitally I think in that time when everything was done by hand when there were calligraphers who had a lot of let's say responsible a lot of uh, they had a place in the graphic design world now it's it's much less mm-hmm. very many graphic designers uh collaborate with calligraphers uh to to do anything but at the time when let's say in the in the environment of newspapers or ads uh each agency had calligraphers so it was everything was used to be done by hand at the time i think uh, uh 
I would I wouldn't look at I would I mean a lot of I I, I think it's a it's a it's a good it's a good time. There there are really interesting shapes, really interesting work coming from that time. I think the clash, I think the the whole uh, shake ha shook, shake happened when uh, Arabic started happening, producing, but started being produced digitally. And initially, a lot of I mean, there's a lot of factors that play here. Technically, there were a lot of limitations to produce something that was easier, or let's say um, that looked more Arabic. And also, I think. Uh, although I consider what we're doing now also an experiment, but at the time they didn't. There's there was not enough information. So yeah. when you create a typeface, what you do is you see what is a typeface and you try to recreate it in that realm and that technical, uh, let's say, constraints. So there were a lot of technical constraints. We are we have a lot of applications now. A lot of technically we have a lot of room to 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 be able to produce, let's say. Yeah more proper looking typefaces. Cool. Okay, quick Q&A. We're going to go through these quite quickly. So the first question is, what are you watching or reading right now? So actually, when I when you when you sent me this question, I was like, oh, what am I reading? Actually, I'm not reading or watching anything. I'm playing Zelda. Amazing. Okay, so you win that question. <laughs> Out of the first 60 events, that's the best, <laughs> that's the best answer. It's, it's, so, it's so addictive. It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm loving it. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Uh, so the first person that came in mind was Tom York. Or That's something. a great answer. <laughs> okay, um, are you a huge Radiohead fan, or just? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I'm a huge Radiohead fan. I, I'm always curious to see the process. How do they come up with these things? So I'm, that's why I would like to. I mean, I've always also, I, I like to also, I've always contemplated on the idea of shadowing a, 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 a film, film director as well, but mm -hmm. I wanted not for a day, for the entire process of a proper film. Yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I can't think of a name now. The first name that popped was Tom York. Yeah. I mean, Tom York is a, a good example of somebody whose work evolves so dramatically over his career that if you listen to his early stuff, you're like, what do you, this is so, you know, so different. Um, Okay, what do people most misunderstand about your work? I I don't know actually. I have I I haven't thought about it. This <laughs> I don't maybe they don't misunderstand. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> I haven't felt. It. I mean, I haven't had an issue where I felt that I I'm being misunderstood. Or your line of work. I guess. I, I mean, sometimes they look at what I. I mean. Maybe sometimes they look at some things that I do that looks traditional, but for me it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But I don't think I don't think I have any like a proper answer okay. to this question. Perfect. Um, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? One person or several? It's up to you. All my friends who are attending this lecture, <laughs> this uh, conversation, especially because they're attending. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think since uh, university, I would say uh, Reza Abedini is one of my, let's say, big design idols. Uh, uh, I love the work of Paul Asher. Uh, I mean, he, he also Yara is also an inspiration. She, I work with her now, but she used to be my in a teacher yeah. at university. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. All cool. Um, okay, with that, we have a lot of really good questions in the chat. So we are going to <laughs> open it up to people. I will unmute you um, or ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, we're going to start with Pearl. Yeah, I'm curious because um, I'm a choreographer. If you felt like any of the dance and music from before it has influenced your work now. Um not necessarily directly, but I think it has influenced me as a person. Uh, I mean, when when it comes to designing, I take think. I mean, I, more, most of the work that you see that I produce has a lot of me in it. So I feel that maybe that's also. I mean, when you're dancing, it's 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 a it's an art form where you're releasing a lot of uh, your own energy, which I think that maybe that's how. It reflects. I mean, I haven't thought about it, but I guess that is how it is. And and do you still dance? 
for no. yourself? My myself, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, bro. Uh, Ahmad? Hi. Hey, Khazak. Hi, Ahmad. Um, uh, so I asked you a question about the um, adaptations of the Disney logos, but I guess uh, Mikey uh, just, just asked the same questions at, at the right time. Uh, so I would like to rephrase um, and ask you maybe about the, when you're adapting something from Latin to Arabic, um, how do you go about it? How do you, um, do you feel like you're compromising maybe the Arabic type rules or um, in, in other words, maybe what are your compasses? Is it only similarity to the Latin version and readability in Arabic or? Yeah, I think, I mean, <sighs> If we're gonna, yeah, if we're gonna go very theoretical, sometimes I think about it and say, yes, anything we're doing to the Arabic is Latinized. We are kind of compromising it. Even the, the, the let's say, lettering particularly, we have much more room to be true to the Arabic script because you don't need to be, but in terms of typefaces, the application comes from a very, the applications we use have a very, let's say Latin approach to it because it's boxes that you're filling in and these boxes come are reminiscent to the metal type, which is a bit alien to the Arabic. But when it comes to uh, adaptations, uh, usually I look at the, the Latin one, I, I, I always redraw it for me to understand the, how the strokes are being handled, but it's usually adapting the, the, the spirit of the, of, let's say the details, not necessarily the shapes, but the general vibe of what I feel in what you see in the, in the Latin. And I take something that is very classical in Arabic and I, I uh, let's say, paint it to like make it fit nicely with the, with the Latin. And also it depends. Sometimes you're doing adaptations where uh, the English, and the Latin and the Arabic are not gonna sit next to each other. So then here you have sometimes much more room to play with the Arabic. You can, you can, you don't need to necessarily have match exactly the same color or the same uh, uh, size, but sometimes when they're more corporate, you, you tend to go towards more the Latin. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ahmad. Uh, Brenda? Hi, um, I'm a librarian, and one of the most challenging things I found when I first started working with books in Arabic was reading the fonts on the pages, on the particularly the title pages. Do you consider what you're doing calligraphy, mm -hmm. or is the digital application just totally different in terms of the way you create the fonts? Oh, yes, it's a completely different uh, world. Hi, Brenda. Uh, it's not, I'm, no, I'm not a calligrapher. I don't consider myself a calligrapher. Calligraph to be able to do calligraphy properly, you need uh, years and years of practice. And it's a very, very particular, it's an art form, basically. I know how to uh, mimic calligraphy if I want to, but I wouldn't consider, consider what I do uh, calligraphy. It's, a, it's definitely a digital application. It's a, it's, a, it's a digital lettering, or sometimes I do also, uh, analog hand lettering, but it's not, it's, it's actually drawing the letter forms rather than calligraphy, you're writing it with a pen. So whatever the stroke, whatever your impression of your hand is, or the, the stroke is, you get in a, in a particular form and you need a lot of patience, a lot of breathing. So yeah, no, I'm very far from calligraphy. I guess one of the, just as a follow-up to Brenda's question, um, when you do projects like the one that are on the screen now, yeah. Are you thinking about um, concealing a concealing meaning in the way that maybe a calligrapher does? Um, um, or are you trying to like transmit the meaning immediately to the reader? Uh, well, um, I don't know exactly. Can you read, what do you mean exactly? I guess, um, I mean like calligraphy artistically concealed deals meaning right because like, yeah. you have to decipher you have to try to figure that out um uh, no it's, it's it's important it's important for me to note that all these uh pieces do start from calligraphy i do work with a calligrapher let's say to i do ask the calligrapher to write something for me in in the full of script so i do have that as a base and then i try because if you if you put the the the, the full of for let's say the the covers for ahlam 
if you put the full of, the full of as is, it's going to give you a very, very particular feel that is that what calligraphy does. And what I try to do is base it on calligraphy, but try to bring it, although it looks very classical looking, uh, I try to bring it to the contemporary time. So I, in, 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 this, in this one particularly also had uh, the, let's say the effects where it's an outline and all these, uh, it's also a, a semi uh, stencil because they, there's like the, the, the mm -hmm. letter are divided. So yeah. I'm started, but no, the, it, it needs to be readable. It needs, it's the title of the book. Okay, great. Um, we got two more questions. One from Lohi. I just asked you to unmute. There you go. Yeah. Hey. So, hey, Khazak. Hi. So, question, Hue, if you could stop what you're doing and learn a new art form from scratch, what would it be? Mm. Learn. I don't know if you can, uh, good question. I, haven't I love this question. Uh, a new one. Or one that you already know, but you are not that experienced with and like master that craft, what would it be? Uh, I always have uh, like semi uh, notes of regrets, but it's not regret that I wish I stayed a dancer or I wish I stayed in the realm of performing arts. So I look at sometimes friends who are in that field uh, and say, oh, did I, 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 I can still, I mean, in terms of performing, I can't because, you know, you get old and it's physics, but I would like to uh, go into the, into film, let's say. Yeah, film. I would say film. Is, is that your final answer? I'm not, yes. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> okay, um, we got uh, Naila as well. Um, Hi, Naila. <laughs> Um, ever since their amazing typeface, IBM Plex was made open source. We've seen it everywhere. Everyone is so excited to use it in their project. So how do you feel like when one of the typefaces you design becomes trendy? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, I feel good, first of all, uh, but it's a, it's a kind of a cheat trendy. It was, it, it's, it was because it was open I at least that's my my explanation to it it's it's an open source typeface it's free everyone can use it so it's it's automatically something that that can help the idea of the spread so but ibm plex was an example for me that i would like to do more projects like this where i do let's say either funding or get paid by a big corporation like ibm and then like get from take from the rich and give to the poor <laughs> <laughs> approach <laughs> yeah, Great. but yeah it is a good feeling i mean uh... for the record you have a better haircut than robin hood just for the record <laughs> good one mikey thanks uh um okay we have rounded out the hour uh bruce i'm sorry we're gonna have to skip your question um Khashag, this was fantastic thank, thank you, you so much for uh, joining it was really a, an honor to have you on Thank you, Mikey. It was, uh, it was an honor to be here. <laughs> and for all of you on the call, we are having another event on Thursday with Todd Ruiz, uh, who is an architectural historian and architect. Um, that's going to be really, really good. If you can, please give us a second and uh, fill out that feedback form. It's a single question. Was this good? Um, and if you're interested in supporting us and being one of our monthly supporters, consider uh, giving to our Patreon campaign, uh, your small but very meaningful contribution keeps this project going and helps our small and nimble team in Beirut help power all this stuff um, and support our dozens of volunteers around the world. Okay, cool. Have a good day, life. Thanks, everyone. Evening, wherever you are. Thanks, Khashag. Peace. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye.